Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our keynote uh, on what is the second day of the summer seminar. It's hard to believe it's only two days. It's been very full already. Um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce my father, Professor Crosby, who will be speaking. Um, Professor Crosby uh, is now Professor Emeritus here at Franciscan University, where he, he taught philosophy for um, 32 years uh, and was the founding chair of the MA philosophy program here, founding director of the MA philosophy program. Before that, um, a professor of philosophy for three years in the uh, at the International Academy of Philosophy in Liechtenstein, where I spent uh, some great years growing up myself with, with my younger siblings. And before that, he was professor of philosophy for 17 years at the University of Dallas. Um, uh, and so uh, upon retiring after 52 years of teaching, uh, recently the first thing he did was sign up for another course. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's deep in the blood and, and hard to give up. Uh, though when he was presented with a lifetime right of attending faculty meetings, that was not so appealing. <laughs> the things they try to sell you, Dad. So, uh, Dr. Crosby was also a student of Dietrich von Hildebrand in von Hildebrand in the last eleven years of von Hildebrand's life. Uh, von Hildebrand became his 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 key philosophical mentor and master, uh, but also in the years of the early pontificate of John Paul II through the encounter of the students of Dietrich von Hildebrand and Karol Wojtyla, uh, my father had the opportunity also to, uh, to come under the influence in a very profound way of, of John Paul, who, uh, again, in his early years and in his, in, in, in when his health was still robust, uh, spending time in conversation with the faculty of the uh, various institutes, and especially of the Institute for Marriage and Family, where my father was a guest professor. So those two influences have in a profound way come together, and I think that one way of understanding the kind of Christian personalist tradition that the Hildebrand Project advances is really through that encounter of the students of, of von Hildebrand with the students of Karol Wojtyla, and this kind of enriched uh, Christian personalism that's flowed from that and is now uh, continued on to subsequent generations of students. Um, Dr. Crosby is also the translator of uh, a number of key Hildebrand books, including The Nature of Love and The Aesthetics. Um, he's the author of, of books. Um, uh, I, the one that perhaps most of you know is The Selfhood of the Human Person, uh, Personalist Papers, The Personalism of John Henry Newman. These are all uh, titles that came out over the years and have developed this tradition of Christian personalism in a very significant way. So, very happy to welcome you uh, to address us. Uh, we're going to do a slightly different format this morning. Um, uh, Professor Crosby will lecture for, the, for 10 or 15 minutes. Then we're going to go to questions uh, from the audience and also from our online audience. And then uh, a second lecture to conclude the presentation and then more discussion. So this allows for as much exchange between our speaker and all of you. So, Professor Crosby, come on up. Well, I must say it's quite a moving experience to be introduced by your own son to uh, a, a meeting like this. Uh, and I should just add to what John Henry said about me translating those works of von Hildebrand, like The Nature of Love. We translated them together. That was a cooperative work. Uh, and so uh, I sh you should not think of me as the soul. Uh, translator. Welcome this, the, to our meeting this morning. And I, as John Henry said, have the idea, uh, since my first section is on gratitude, what it is in principle, uh, what it's not, uh, I, I, it, it forms a, a unified part of the paper. I thought I would present that first, take your questions, and then turn to my particular topic on the gratitude that we practice in accepting our own being. All right, so uh, I have, uh, in reflection, discerned four fundamental features of gratitude. Uh, 
The first. Gratitude is fundamentally interpersonal. Let me explain. A few weeks ago, I came across an article in the New York Times reporting on some recent psychological research on gratitude. According to this research, habits of gratitude are extremely beneficial for our overall well-being. But it was immediately evident to me that these researchers were not talking about gratitude, but about something different altogether. They said that people who count their blessings, who don't get hung up on the pain in their lives, but who focus on the positive are happier than people who don't do these things. And the researcher took it for granted that these optimistic souls were happier because of the strong presence of gratitude in their lives. But counting your blessings on the one hand and being grateful on the other are two entirely different things. And the reason is clear. You can count your blessings without thanking anyone. You can do it in solitude, but you can't be grateful without relating to another. In gratitude, you're taken out of your solitude and you relate to some other person, to some benefactor. So gratitude is fundamentally interpersonal. If you think that some blessing has come to you by a necessity of nature and without the involvement of any person, you may be very glad to receive this blessing, but grateful for it you cannot be. Perhaps in counting your blessings you think about other persons, namely those other persons who are blessings in your life. But in counting these others, you don't enter into an interpersonal relation with them. You don't relate to them in a way that involves something like thanking. We can, of course, admit that persons who count their blessings are more likely to practice gratitude than, and to thank others. But still, it's important to do justice to the interpersonal nature of gratitude and to see how this interpersonal structure distinguishes gratitude from merely counting one's blessings. That's the first mark of gratitude that I would propose for your consideration. Secondly, gratitude presupposes not only a person who gives, but a certain freedom in the one who gives. Why is it that you and I don't receive from the IRS any letters thanking us for paying our taxes? <laughs> we, we only hear from the IRS when we fail to pay our taxes, but not when we conscientiously pay them. And the answer is clear, we have a legal obligation to pay taxes. In other words, the IRS has a legal claim on us to pay taxes. And this claim eliminates the space of freedom within which the generosity of gratitude exists. By contrast, consider the Good Samaritan. He helps the injured man by acting out of love of neighbor, and he thereby goes far beyond any legal obligations he may have toward him. And this is why the injured man will be deeply grateful to the Good Samaritan and thank him profusely. The Good Samaritan has the freedom he needs in order to give a generous gift to the injured man. But if it were an insurance agent, so not a Levite or a priest, if it were an insurance agent who passed by, and if he recognized in the injured man a client of his, someone who had bought an insurance policy 
from him that covered bodily injury, then he would have a contractual obligation to help him, and this would shut down the possibility of the injured man being grateful for the help he receives. So that's the second feature of gratitude, a certain freedom in the sense of freedom from a strict legal obligation to confer some benefit. And here is a third uh, feature. Uh, gratitude is a fundamental moral good. So it's from the value point of view, not neutral or, or even negative, but it's something fundamentally and profoundly good. Von Hildebrand says in the essay on gratitude uh, of his that you read that a really grateful person will prefer to receive some benefit from the kindness of the giver than to receive that benefit merely on the basis of a legal claim to it. A transaction that includes gratitude toward a giver is normally morally better than a transaction that achieves the same result but without the opportunity for gratitude. In his memoirs, von Hildebrand speaks of his years as a refugee in Europe, fleeing first from Austria to Switzerland, from Switzerland to France, from France to Portugal, from Portugal to the United States. And he says that a particular blessing of that time of his life was his complete dependency on the charity of people who, many of whom he didn't even know, but on whose help he had no legal claim. He said that this was an experience an experience of uh, the generosity of others that he would not have wanted to miss. And the blessing consisted in the fact that he was able to experience the generosity of others and his own gratitude on a scale that would not have been possible if he had been able to provide for himself out of his own resources or to claim help from someone who owed it to him. So it's precisely the absence of any such claim, the absence of any money of his own that created the setting in which uh, gratitude and the singular beauty and glory of gratitude was possible. We hear a great deal uh, today about the curse of uh, excessive individualism in the American and Western European world. And we can express this individualism in terms of gratitude, and we can say that the individualist resents that dependency on a giver that comes from being indebted to the kindness of the giver. The individualist feels oppressed by this dependency. He would much rather uh, provide for himself than depend on the kindness of others. By contrast, von Hildebrand strikes a blow uh, against this individualism by affirming the great good that gratitude is and by showing that there is a unique happiness to be had by depending on the kindness of others and being grateful to them. Von Hildebrand, in other words, understands well this third feature of gratitude which I'm proposing to you, whereas the individualist fails altogether to understand it. So that's the third um, uh, mark or fundamental feature of gratitude. And here's one more, then we can take uh, your questions. There is a certain reverence in the giver that is required for gratitude. Romano Guardini, uh, a rich, rich source on, on these questions, writes, and it's in that uh, little selection of his on acceptance that was in the packet, 
He writes, if the one who helps lets the other feel his superiority, then gratitude dies, and in its place we find humiliation and resentment. End of the quote from Guardini. After all, the one who helps occupies a position above the uh, one who needs the help. It can really easily happen that the helper makes his superior position felt in a way that wounds the self-respect of the one who receives the help. It is reverence toward the recipient that lets this person receive help while fully maintaining his self-respect. Among contemporary writers <coughs> on gratitude, there are not a few who see in gratitude a thinly veiled power struggle in which the giver tries to subjugate the recipient by means of a gift. It is reverence for the recipient, as Gordini says, that protects gratitude from this deformity. So <clears throat> those are four, with no claim uh, to give an exhaustive account of something so rich and deep as gratitude, but at least four uh, essential features of it. Uh, so there is the uh, interpersonal structure of gratitude, a certain freedom in the sense of free from legal obligation. There is the singular moral worth and excellence of gratitude. And fourthly, there is this reverence required of the giver uh, needed for the health and integrity of giving and receiving. So, um, I'll proceed then uh, in a minute to my main topic of gratitude for one's own being. Uh, but I thought that uh, there may be some questions here on the attempt to characterize uh, uh, gratitude and identify right. it for what it essentially is so that we don't, so that, like in the New York Times, go around speaking of gratitude where in fact something quite different is at issue. So dad, we're, Christopher and I both have microphones. Okay. I see um, Mark. Mark. Okay. Keep and, raising your hands. Yes. And please keep your comments brief, which I know you're very good at. And <coughs> we, that's the other innovation here. We'd like people to stand up, say it, stand up, say your name when you ask your question so that the speaker and others can Steven. Hi, this is Mark Spencer. Thanks, John. Um, so this is not a, a, a disagreement with anything you said, um, but it's a, a sort of a strange case that I want you to speak to. Uh -huh. um, so I have a lot of uh, non-theistic acquaintances and students yeah. who uh, engage in acts of thanking the universe for their blessings, I guess. I um, and they, they don't they're not pantheists they, they don't take the universe to be identical to a person uh. um, but they really seem to exhibit uh, many of the sorts of acts and feelings that go around mm. that, that have to do with gratitude yeah. um, and so th they certainly take themselves to be engaging in gratitude yeah. but it's not in per interpersonal they don't take the universe to be free the universe yeah. doesn't have reverence for them, though I'm not so clear on what they think the universe's yeah, attitude, so right. to speak, is towards them. Um, so if you could just speak to this, like, what's going on here um, in these cases where uh, people really take themselves to be uh, grateful, and they really seem to exhibit gratitude, uh, but not to a person. Right, right. Okay, well, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's a very good, uh, thoughtful question, and I've encountered... Uh, just such people. And it, it seems to me that either um, the universe is something they're glad about, they're glad it's there, and they confuse that wrongly with the specific thing of gratitude. Or they, despite being not yet theists, are in fact already somehow theists. They, ha at the instinctual level, when they thank 
the universe somehow discern a uh, some some kind of personal divine being uh, b behind the benefits. Uh, so I would confront them with that alternative. If they insist that they're thanking, then I would say uh, challenge them to think that perhaps they've become theists uh, thanks to the imperative of gratitude. And if they fight you on that, then I think one can say they're not calling things by their proper names. <laughs> Hello, my name is Emily Otto, and I was wondering about your second characteristic of the freedom of the giver uh -huh. in relation to a parent-child relationship, where a parent um, has a moral obligation to the child, right. but also uh, the generosity that right. is hopefully there um, yeah. on behalf of the parents. Right. And then, so first of all, just asking in a healthy relation, parent-child right. relationship, right. Um, but then secondly, when maybe that relationship isn't as healthy and maybe that reverence of the parent for the child is lacking. Um, what, did that, what does that look like, especially in light of what we discussed yesterday of um, that being the second place that gratitude is due after God? <laughs> let, let, let me be sure I have the question. So you, you're um, saying the child can be grateful to the parent even though the parent clearly has a moral obligation to care for the child. Is, is that the... Yes, that's what oh, I was asking. Of, yeah. um, how does how does that right. gratitude work um, and in some ways where that freedom of the giver may not be as right. great? Right, okay. I, I made a point of saying that what what shuts down the possibility of gratitude is being subject to a legal obligation. Uh, so a contractual obligation, the obligation that we have to the IRS, that kind of obligation uh, constrains or limits freedom in a way that uh, eliminates the possibility of real gratitude. But surely moral obligation can cohere with gratitude. Take the Good Samaritan, the, the example I used. We probably would agree, certainly, Jesus in teaching that uh, parable thought that the Good Samaritan had an obligation to stop and help. It wasn't just optional, something to take or leave, but that there was a deep obligation rooted in love of neighbor. Uh, and yet the response of the Good Samaritan was sufficiently free in order to be an object of thanks on the part of the one who was helped. So I would uh, try to meet that difficulty by distinguishing legal and moral obligation. Uh, and say that moral obligation leaves entirely open uh, all kinds of uh, gift-giving, conferral of benefits, uh, all those things that uh, awaken gratitude. So we could take uh, maybe one more. Michael Healy. Yes, uh, Michael. Uh, my question along the same lines, it seems to me even legal obligation doesn't eliminate gratitude unless I'm acting out of only that legal yeah. obligation. I can still right. be free and generous beyond that. Yeah. And I do think the IRS should send me a thank you note. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I, I'm sure there are other good questions, but maybe we should uh, uh, proceed. Is that right, John Henry? Uh, yes, let's proceed. All right. More questions on this part of my paper we can certainly entertain at the end. So now I come to the um, announced topic of the grateful acceptance of my own being. So gratitude can be studied at different levels in the human person. I can be grateful to a friend who left me a generous inheritance or grateful to a good Samaritan who rescued me from some danger. But I can be grateful in a different, more comprehensive way when I am grateful to God for my very existence. This latter gratitude encompasses my whole being in a way in which 
my gratitude for the inheritance or even the rescue from danger does not encompass my whole being. We might call this gratitude for my whole being by the name of metaphysical gratitude, and it will form the focus uh, of all that follows in this presentation. Now, in approaching this metaphysical gratitude, let me begin with a remarkable, well-known fact about uh, us human persons. Whereas plants and animals live in a natural solidarity with themselves, we human persons live constantly at a certain distance to ourselves. We are constantly a problem to ourselves. Unlike plants and animals, we are handed over to ourselves and challenged to a work of self-creation. We are not just content to be ourselves, but we are always reaching beyond ourselves, imagining what we might yet be, striving to surpass ourselves. And so we are restless, unstable creatures. Now this restlessness and instability makes itself felt in a particular way as soon as I realize that much that I aspire for is beyond my reach. For example, I may lack talents that I wish I had and that others have and that I cannot give myself. And so I face a crisis of self-acceptance. I can refuse to accept myself with my limited abilities. Or I can accept myself in the midst of my limitations. I can live in a perpetual protest against the finite self that I am. Or I can live in a certain loyalty to myself, an expression of Guardini, despite all its finitude. Only in the latter case can I be grateful for my being. In the former case, the refusal to accept myself shuts down the possibility for grateful self-acceptance. Well, let's examine a little more closely uh, this crisis of self-acceptance. Uh, Guardini describes it vividly uh, in another writing that was partially translated in your packet of readings. He describes vividly this temptation to refuse to accept all the finitude that oppresses me in my being. And he writes, it is possible to rebel against having to be oneself. Why should I anyway? Did I ask to exist? There is the feeling that it's no longer worth it to be oneself. What does it profit me? I bore myself. I disgust myself. I cannot stand it any longer with myself. There is the feeling, continuing here with Guardini, of being locked in myself. I am only so much, and yet I want to be more. I have only this talent, yet I want greater and more splendid talents. It's always the same thing which I have to do. I always run up against the same limits. I always commit the same mistakes, undergo the same failure. End of that quote from Mardini's essay on the acceptance of oneself. Now, it's not difficult to see that this inescapability of my limitations tempts me to protest against the self that I am and to refuse to be who I am, saying, in effect, that my being is fatally flawed, fundamentally unacceptable as a result of having these limitations. Now, Guardini does not think that the way out of this refusal to accept oneself is simply to live in unquestioning solidarity with myself like the plants and animals. No, he thinks that I'm right to examine myself, to subject myself to the judgment of a higher law, to repent of my sins, 
to seek healing, to start anew, to imagine new possibilities in myself, to let myself be challenged by others. I'm right to want to be alive as a person, but there is a way, Guardini holds, to live as a person without protesting against my creaturehood. There is a way of wanting to grow beyond myself even while preserving what Guardini calls this zum eigenen sein, fidelity to one's own being. Now what exactly is this fidelity to one's own being and how do I practice it? I turn to a very rich text. It's also in the packet of readings of Josef Ratzinger to get uh, the best answer I have been able to find to this question. Ratzinger explains it like this. I encounter another who really loves me and who expresses this love, saying to me, how good it is that you exist. And he does not mean what great qualities you have what great intelligence, what great gifts of leadership you have. Such qualities can exist in other persons besides me. The one who loves me means to say instead how good it is that you exist as this unrepeatable person. He means that without me, something would be missing from the world, something that no possible subsequent person could supply. And Ratzinger uh, includes here the very significant and rich thought that uh, this full experience of being an unrepeatable person uh, cannot be had in solitude. I need to hear it from another who says how good it is that you exist. I can't in solitude think how good it is that I exist. Uh, we have to receive this sense of the goodness of our being from another who loves us. We see here the radically interpersonal structure of personal existence. Now, if you accept the love of the other, Ratzinger continues, you are in a position to practice the self-acceptance of which we are speaking. You cease to be oppressed by your finitude. You are now aware of something in yourself in virtue of which you are worthy of being loved. Ratzinger says this enables you to rejoice in your existence. You can experience gratitude for your being. You will, of course, still criticize yourself and find yourself wanting in many ways, but you will do this out of a loyalty to uh, the unrepeatable person that you are. Now this reflection of Ratzinger goes deep, I think, into the mystery of self-acceptance. But he is not finished. He takes, make, makes another move that I have not in the same way seen in any other author. And he takes the subject to a deeper level still. I quote, we come now to the all-important question, Ratzinger says, is it true then when someone says to me it is good that you exist? Is it really good that I exist? Is it not possible that that person's love, which wills my existence, is just a tragic error? If, if the love that gives me courage to exist is not based on truth, then I must, in the end, come to curse the love that deceives me. End of that quote. Ratzinger thinks that many people today, despite the experience of being loved, cannot muster the courage to exist, to accept themselves. And in fact, he goes on to say, quote, how many persons today would dare to affirm this question from the heart, to believe that it is good that they exist, 
That is the source of the anxiety and despair that incessantly afflict mankind. And that quote. Now, in order to overcome this anxiety and to root my self acceptance in the truth, Ratzinger turns, where else? To the Christian proclamation. I quote uh, again from the same passage God finds man so important that he himself has suffered for man. The cross is, in truth, the center of the glad tidings of the gospel. It is good that you exist. No, it is necessary that you exist. The cross, still Ratzinger here, is the approbation of our existence, not in words, but in an act so completely radical that it caused God to become flesh and pierced this flesh to the quick. But if God so loves us, Ratzinger concludes, then, then, we are loved in truth, then life is worth living. End of that quote. Then the one, I could unpack it a little more in the spirit of Ratzinger, then the one who loves me and says, how good it is that you exist, speaks like a prophet. He is not conjuring up a beautiful illusion, but is announcing a truth about my being that is ratified by the Son of God. I am no longer oppressed by my limitedness and finitude. The God who calls me by my name has revealed in me a dignity and a glory that I have as this unrepeatable person. And so Ratzinger comes to the conclusion that I have every assurance that the goodness of my being mediated to me by the human persons who love me has a divine sanction and that I can give myself over to the metaphysical gratitude that wells up in me. Now, uh, in the final section of my paper, I bring in uh, the great Kierkegaard, who, especially in his famous study on despair, uh, has much to say uh, about uh, our topic uh, and, and uh, has much to teach us about the deep inner obstacles in ourselves to self-acceptance. Now, let me dwell a little longer with Kierkegaard on this divine approbation of our being that Ratzinger invokes. There's a memorable passage in Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death in which he meditates on this divine approbation, and he starts like this. If I were to imagine a poor day laborer and the mightiest emperor who ever lived. And if this mightiest emperor suddenly seized on the idea of sending for the day laborer, who had never dreamed that the emperor knew he existed, who would then consider himself indescribably favored just to be permitted to see the emperor once, something he would relate to his children and grandchildren as the most important event in his life. If the emperor sent for him and told him that he wanted him for a son-in-law. What then? And Kierkegaard continues, Christianity teaches that this particular individual and every individual exists before God. This individual, who perhaps would be vain for having once in his life talked with the king, this man who is not a little proud of being on intimate terms with this or that person, this man exists before God, can talk with God at any moment. He will sure to be heard by him. In short, this man is invited to live on the most intimate terms with God. Furthermore, for this man's sake, God came into the world, let himself be born, suffers and dies, and this suffering God almost begs and treats 
this man to help, to accept the help which is offered to him. End of that quote. So it's clear that Kierkegaard, like Ratzinger, is meditating on the Christian good news insofar as it implies a divine approbation of our existence. They concur in thinking that this divine approbation is the foundation of Christian self-acceptance, the foundation of Christian joy and Christian gratitude. But Kierkegaard does something that Ratzinger in that passage does not do. Kierkegaard examines the resistance that stirs in our heart when we hear of the extravagant love that God has for each of us. You might think that the offer of such extravagant love would be simply irresistible. How could we not gratefully open ourselves to receive this so utterly unexpected love? But Kierkegaard discerns rightly that there is something here which can scandalize us that can give us offense and thus can inhibit the gratitude we would otherwise experience in response to the good news of salvation history. The passage there in Kierkegaard uh, goes on like this. Truly, if there is anything to lose one's mind over, this is it. Everyone lacking the humble courage to dare to believe this is offended. But why is he offended? Because it is too high for him, because his mind cannot grasp it, because he cannot attain bold confidence in the face of it, and therefore must get rid of it, pass it off as a bagatelle, nonsense and folly, for it seems as if it would choke him. End of that quote. But what exactly is this offense that can be taken at the Christian proclamation? Kierkegaard answers that there is a deep spiritual sloth that afflicts us in our inmost parts. It is a sloth in the sense of achedia, discussed by St. Thomas Aquinas and discussed by J.J. Uh, Sanford in his uh, presentation yesterday. Kierkegaard expresses uh, this sloth not only in the passage quoted, but in this sentence, and I quote it, the narrow-mindedness of the natural man cannot welcome for itself the extraordinary life which God has intended for him, so he is offended. Now, in trying to understand uh, Kierkegaard and just what this offense is, I am reminded of something very significant that Dietrich von Hildebrand says several times in his aesthetics. He says that mediocrity hates beauty. He means that beauty says to us, in effect, sursum corda, lift up your hearts. Beauty requires a special elan from us, an upsurge, a spirited expansion of the heart. But the mediocre person, and here you see the special sense in which he uses the term mediocre, is too wedded to his comfort zone, and so he resents the sursum corda of beauty. This resentment is just like the resentment of the person who is offended by the extravagance of the redemptive deeds of God that are announced in the gospel. It is with good reason that Pieper, Joseph Pieper, in explaining the meaning of Achedia, and hardly anyone has explained it as profoundly as Joseph Pieper, um, uh, he uh, refers to the lack of Hochgemutheit, that is, a certain lack of high-mindedness or of magnanimity in the addressee of Revelation. It may seem as if the Achidia described by Kierkegaard in the tradition 
is a kind of humility. Nothing bad at all, but the virtue of humility. Because the person afflicted by achidia says, in effect, the encounter with the Christian God is something too awe-inspiring, something too overwhelming. I prefer to live on a more modest scale amid the relativities of finite being. This may sound like humility, but in fact, this kind of spiritless talk has nothing to do with humility. It is servile talk and a, and a caricature of humility. But Hildebrand rightly says in discussing humility that humility is distinguished from pseudo-humility by a certain audacity or boldness. It follows that the self-acceptance that we're trying to understand is born of a certain audacity and cannot exist without it. Now, Kierkegaard does not exactly mean that persons afflicted by achidia want to get rid of Christianity as if it were a burden. Achidia is more complicated than that. Those who reject a life of faith in Christ as something too much for them are at the same time fascinated by it. They glimpse in such a life something of the fulfillment beyond all they could have dreamed of their deepest aspirations. And so it is not without a profound sense of loss that they decline it as being a too heavy weight of glory. A darkness enters into their hearts and they turn away for these people despair of ever participating in the superabundance of Christian existence. And it is perhaps worth also adding here um, that uh, the person who lacks this audacity uh, to become a Christian, to accept himself, uh, to believe in the goodness of his own being, the person lacking that audacity need not always be a morally bad person. This person may be wounded by some trauma or some psychological disability, and may be far more in needing of healing than of repentance. So though Achadia is traditionally called a vice, in fact a capital vice, uh, it may in fact exist in a manner, in a given case, more sick than vicious. But even in this case, it still amounts to an impediment to gratitude, and that is what concerns us in this paper. So much then in uh, this latter part of my paper on sloth and achadia, we have seen why these are impediments to receiving the Christian message, and why they are therefore impediments to receiving the divine approbation of our being that is contained in the Christian message. Whoever awakens out of spiritual slope and has the spiritual audacity to believe the Christian message receives a divine approbation of his being. He hears the words, not only from those who love him, but also from the Lord himself, how good it is that you exist. And he becomes thereby capable of self-acceptance. To conclude, there's much that we can learn uh, from Kierkegaard about the grateful acceptance of ourselves, which he calls willing to be the self that we are. He can teach us how to be faithful to our own being, even as we critically examine ourselves and strive to grow beyond our deficiencies. He can help us to practice metaphysical gratitude for our being and to live not by grievance, but by gratitude. Thank you. Okay, so we have some good time for questions. We'll do the same as before. Stand up, see your name. Uh, let's be as concise as possible. We'll get as many questions in as possible. 
Jim Beauregard, as you were talking about that, that notion of audacity and humility, what, what I was thinking of was Mary. Was that not? Yep, so what I was thinking of was Mary, and specifically about Bernard of Clairvaux's meditation on yeah. the Annunciation, yeah. where he, he's, he focuses not on Gabriel's message, not on Mary's response, but on the moment in between. Yeah. And he makes the statement, let humility be bold. He's exhorting her to say yes, and he's essentially yeah. saying to her, this is not the moment to keep your mouth shut. Yes, yeah, right. And right. the thought I had as you were talking right. was that, that part of that, and I'd like mm -hmm. to hear your response to this, part of that audacity is that willingness to, to say yes and to leap into what is going to be right. totally unknown right. and may put me in positions I've never been in before yeah, right. and that are going to be frightening. No. What are your thoughts about that, that aspect of it? Yeah, no, I think that's a, 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 a beautiful thought uh, to see in the fiat of Mary uh, this, this audacity uh, of which uh, I speak, this antithesis to the spiritual sloth. She didn't say, oh, I'm just a modest little girl here in Nazareth. I don't amount to much. Go ask somebody else. Uh, 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 to bear the Redeemer, but uh, I must have practiced uh, a very great boldness, courageous audacity in, uh, in saying yes. So I, I find that a very uh, helpful uh, scriptural uh, illustration of what I was talking about. Uh, yeah, so... Um I wanted to return uh, to the comment by uh, Guardini uh, that you mentioned in the, in the first uh, part of your paper, uh, that when the giver makes his superiority felt, uh -huh. that that uh, takes away uh, it, or the space for gratitude and leaves in its place only humiliation and uh, resentment. Um, and I wanted to sort of challenge this and, and get your, your thoughts. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm writing on excellence right now, and a big part of my thoughts are taken up by objective superiority and inferiority, uh -huh. uh, say it, skill in the, in the violin. And something that rubs me the wrong way is a common, uh, what I perceive to be anyway, a kind of disingenuousness uh, on the part of people who are objectively superior um, and, and can play the violin uh, better, let's say, right. um, and a, a kind of sense in Christian right. circles often that right. that they that such a person should s sort of poo-poo their their own yeah, right. uh, ability, um, and I I think that it's uh, constitutive of certain relationships uh, that that um, objective superiority is made to be felt. Right. Right. Um, I think uh, most obviously in what we've already discussed here, uh, the teacher student relation. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it, it's important to that relation that uh, the violin teacher um, does make it felt uh, yeah. <laughs> his superior skill at the violin right. and that, that is in fact part of the uh, relationship and, and proper to the relationship. Mm -hmm. I can also think of other uh, scenarios. Um, I heard a, a, an excellent paper where uh, it, it was argued that a, a heart surgeon, who's the best heart surgeon in the hospital and knows it, um, in the operating room, it is in fact sometimes important for the success of the operation that he makes his superior knowledge and skill felt uh, yeah, right, and right, um, for, right. for the sake yeah, of the patient. Right. Uh, we're a military commander would yeah, be another example. Right. So um, yeah. it, it seems to me that gratitude is still right and proper and, and in fact done uh, in those yeah. kinds of scenarios. I'm yeah, you can right. Now that. certainly uh, uh, the, if you have some real gift, uh, it's not humility, it's pseudo-humility to pretend that you don't. Uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Beethoven knew that he had uh, a rare uh, gift from the gods uh, to make uh, mu beautiful music and it would have been silly, you know, to pretend that he had no talent as a composer. So uh, that, uh, but I don't think that's in opposition to what I'm saying. I, I have in mind more the specific situation of a gift being conferred by one on another. And it's in that conferral of the gift that the danger of somehow lording it over the recipient to the point of humiliating them is, is great. And so, uh, but in other settings, uh, you know, the uh, acknowledging your gifts or the surgeon, knowing that he uh, knows really how to do this surgery very well, that uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't see that as ungrateful. I mean, that's just recognizing the truth uh, about oneself. Uh, and, 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 and if, if that's, uh, 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 I mean, a person would have to be very egotistical to be offended, you know, by the sur surgeon claiming uh, real authority and real skills that he really has. We have a so, question. So, yeah, I, 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 if we just focus on the particular situation, like with the Good Samaritan of conferring a gift on someone in need, it's that existence of a particular need met by the giver that <clears throat> creates the possibility for this uh, humiliation. Yeah. We have a question from an online participant um, joining us all the way from the Holy Land. Um, this is from Frank Cantor. He asks, how do we help young people who are feeling overwhelmed by life and finding suicide an attractive option to accept the divine approbation of our existence with the suspicion of all motives that suggests that their existence is a unique blessing? We seem to be failing to engage them at this level. Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, certainly the thing described by Ratzinger uh, is important. There, there, this love for another that says how good it is that you exist. A lot of people have never heard that from anybody in their lives. And so to hear that spoken from the heart could reach a young person uh, troubled about the worth of his own existence. Then there's the further step that Ratzinger takes of the divine approbation. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we're off to a good start, uh, you might say, with this uh, affirmation of the goodness that I exist. Uh, whoever can speak those words really mean them uh, to a struggling person uh, may, may well be able to break through and help uh, the person on, on the path to real self-acceptance. Hi, I'm Daniel Stefke. So um, when I was like 10 years old, I read this Choose Your Own Adventure book where uh, one of the endings was uh, you literally become Genghis Khan. It was like one of the bad endings. Right. Um, and so that's like a silly way of, <laughs> if you really desired that, yeah. that would be a, a, a sort of a silly way of refusing to accept yourself. Yeah. But I, I wonder what ways you think we might be characteristically tempted to not accept ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, whenever we see in others an excellence that really resonates with us, you know, suppose I see in someone a far more gifted, uh, clear-thinking philosopher than I am, and I wish I uh, had that gift, uh, well, there, um, th there's the, 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 the challenge to acknowledge all the points of finitude that are coherent with this existence as being a unique and unrepeatable person. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think... Uh, yeah, but there's also dreams of uh, even being another person altogether, like in your story, th fantasies and unhealthy uh, imaginings of alternative worlds and alternative selves. Uh, that, But I, I think, um, in, in my experience, it's... The danger is greatest with regard to um, personal excellences that one really admires in another and would like nothing so much as to have for oneself there. This Christian self-acceptance has its work cut out. Uh, Michael Healy, uh, one more step might be taken with Kierkegaard that shows the limits of reason and philosophy and even natural religion. Uh, that I, what I've done to myself as a sinner mm -hmm. means I'm a worm that ought to crawl out of the, of the light of day. Yeah. And so to fully accept myself, including my sinfulness, I have to accept the forgiveness right. of sins. Exactly. Yeah, right. And so this distinguishes even all natural religion right. from Christianity. Right, right. And that would be a, a classic case of achedia, you know, of the spiritual sloth. Oh, my sin, it's too great to be uh, forgiven. By God, that would be uh, evading this divine uh, extravagance uh, uh, with a with a display of insincere humility. So <clears throat> that readiness to receive forgiveness certainly uh, is part of the 
uh, Christian self-acceptance that we're talking about. Yes. Oh, well, let's see. John Henry, uh, we've got... Hi, um, Bridget Bogan. I was just curious if it's possible, like metaphysically speaking, for um, someone to accept their existence without gratitude, and if that's the case, what it would look like. Uh-huh. Accept one's limits without gratitude. To accept their existence without gratitude. Accept their existence. Like, does Satan accept his existence, but yeah. without any gratitude towards God for it? Yeah. Well, I suppose um, there is a kind of acceptance, uh, you know, that says, well, I'm alive, I'm going to make the best of it. Uh, and so one accepts one's existence as something, as the basis for everything else. One says, I'm not going to commit suicide or reject my existence. I'll accept it and uh, play ball with life. But uh, there may be no sense of gratitude. There may be no sense of, uh, you know, some person conferring a great good on me. Yeah, so a kind of inevitable uh, acceptance of my existence. You know, I can't take another step unless I come to terms with the fact that I exist. So that it could be a kind of spiritless, inevitable uh, uh, self-acceptance. It wouldn't have, wouldn't have any of the notes of gratitude to it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Monica Costanzo. Um, my question was, if you have a friend who is suffering from this type of acedia, more from... A friend who? A friend who's suffering from this type of acedia, yeah. more from the point of being psychologically sick rather than a vice, how would you be able to explain to them that they are worth being loved despite their sins without yeah. them thinking this is pride? Yeah, right. Yeah, <clears throat> well, again, the thing I mentioned of, um, you know, this uh, saying to a person how good it is that you exist, that could have great power in the case of a psychologically damaged person, uh, no less than in the case of somebody who more maliciously pulls away uh, from God. And so uh, that, I think, would have great healing power. Uh, uh, and so I would uh, appeal to it again, uh, uh, not the first time in this discussion, but appeal to it again as uh, a way of uh, somehow calling a person out of this despair over themselves and uh, uh, empowering them to uh, will to, to exist and, and even uh, be grateful for their existence. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Hi, John. Uh, Bill Tullius. Yes, um, Bill. This is sort of a dovetailing off of the question a moment ago. Uh, I wanted to ask about the relationship between um, this sort of metaphysical gratitude, um, self-affirmation, mm -hmm. and then the phenomenon of apostasy. Oh. Um, I think that, that many in my generation at this point know others who perhaps grew up in the church, mm -hmm. um, but who have left, um, now mm -hmm. either are agnostic or, or atheist. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that this is presented is often as a radical sort of self-affirmation. Perhaps mm -hmm. um, they've come to awareness of a homosexual identity or uh -huh. something of that sort where it seems uh -huh. that self-affirmation and of a radical sort of self-acceptance yeah, requires right. um, precisely not this metaphysical gratitude that you've been discussing, but, yeah. but uh, an entirely different response. And I just wonder um, yeah. how we fit this into uh, the, the, the overall structure that, that you're describing. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's... Uh, uh, there is, a, I hear, you know, psychologists and counselors talking about a kind of self-affirmation that's quite self-destructive. Uh, and, and I guess the defining thing there is willing to find the goodness of one's being, but with being unwilling to receive it from another. You know, one has one's own uh, conception of what makes one lovable and one imagines one has it or uh, uh, tries to build up that. And uh, so without the assistance of another who loves me to uh, achieve some kind of self-affirmation. And uh, if Ratzinger has it right, you know, that uh, uh, this shows our 
radical orientation one to another, our dependency on one another, then that self-affirmation will, uh, will, will not bear any fruit. Uh, and yeah, so that, uh, that's the first thing that uh, uh, occurs to me, uh, that the attempt to bypass the other and attempt to uh, find my, the goodness of my own being as a gift given to me in a way by another. Um, but to have my own being devised by myself on my own terms according to the excellences I think I ought to have. That self-referential way of affirming oneself, uh, it's common and uh, uh, but it's, I think, you know, has no future. It can bear no fruit. Hello, um, my name is William McCauley. Um, I was wondering if you could further explain the role that individuality plays as a source of ontological value. Individuality, say it again. Um, the role that individuality plays as a source of ontological value. Um, you oh. mentioned that you replaced. Oh yeah, right. Image. Yeah, Indivi yeah, right. Well, I think um, that's a subject on which I've thought a lot uh, uh, and worked a lot. And some of my friends and colleagues will probably think, "Oh no, there he's going again." Probably Pat Lee is thinking that right now, <laughs> thinking uh, I will talk about the unrepeatability of persons yet again. Uh, so. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that is a certain individuality, that the fact that I exist not my, as an instance of a type, a mere instance of a type, replaceable by any other equally good instance, but that I am unrepeatably by myself, unrepeatably myself. That is a certain strength, a metaphysically strong individuality. Uh, and it has, it's right at the heart of this, this, this worth and goodness of another person. In other words, insofar as we have excellences that can be picked up and repeated by others, then um, uh, you know, our worth is limited. It's somehow uh, in the other two. But the worth as, our, as this prop, this person, this, this eigene sein that Gordini speaks of, this being of my own, that is, I think, a, um, uh, that, that's right at the heart of, uh, you know, the, the, the worth and dignity of a person. You know, you, you think of, uh, let's say, um, <clears throat> think of, of, of flowers, you know, what a great thing it is that there uh, are so many flowers, roses, and lilies, and all the rest in the world. But it's really not at all essential that a given rose stay in existence. Why? Because if it wilts, another of the same kind can take its place. And in a way, it continues in existence through many exemplars or instances. But with a person, uh, you know, there is no um, uh, other who can uh, take over and instantiate all that was good and lovable in the first person, so that, so that there is a point to persons enduring in being, uh, where there's, there's no such point. The roses are kept in being if they succeed each other endlessly. Uh, but with persons, there's something there that ought to uh, endure, because it exists only one time in the person. So, Hi, um, my name is Renee Corcoran. I have a question. You said that obligation eliminates the space for freedom in which the generosity of gratitude exists. Um, that the obligation, um, is there, and this is kind of building on a previous question, but as I, I know that God is good, right? So in some sense, I expect, like I claim his, his generosity and his goodness. Yeah. Is there, is a state of being undeserving, constitutive of, an, of the gratitude, the reciprocal gra uh, uh -huh. relationship of gratitude? Yeah. So you know, you, you're saying, is there a way of claiming, um, what, forgiveness or claiming grace uh, according to the promises 
of the Lord. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea that God, I often times hear Christians say, um, you know, you don't deserve God's grace. Be right. grateful. You don't deserve, you know, his, he, right. you know, he's God. And I think that okay. uh, just even thinking about the indiv- the dignity of the individual human person, I expect like I lay claim to the fact that I deserve goodness from God in some sense. Yeah. Um, that it, it feels in some sense I would expect nothing less yeah, than right. this gratitude from God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, certainly true. We expect God to fulfill his promises and therefore we uh, uh, maybe make certain claims and remind, you know, Lord, you promised uh, us this promised land. Uh, don't abandon us now. So you lay, make a claim on God that is somehow based on his own promise. And so the fulfillment of that kind of claim could be, I think, uh, you know, uh, 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 thanked for, that God is faithful to his promises. One can thank for that. Because certainly the divine promise that's uh, of another order of magnitude altogether from a, a legal obligation or a contractual obligation. So, yeah, God can't deny himself. If he's promised something, he's sure to give it. I count on that. I claim it. Uh, but in a way, that lets me still thank for, because I'm thereby still thanking for the original promise and therefore also for the fulfillment of it. And yeah, so that would be a situation of claim that I don't think would interfere with thanking and being grateful. We're going to do one last question. All right. My name is Matt Wilde. I was just hoping you would comment on the relationship between trust and gratitude. Yeah. <clears throat> because it seems like I can't be grateful no matter how great the gift seems if I don't actually trust the person. Right. Which, if I don't have faith and hope in God, how can I be grateful for my being or salvation? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> that's right. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's certainly a condition uh, for... Uh, accept, uh, uh, receiving from another human being and then receiving this divine approbation uh, that I trust the other human and trust God. So, uh, yeah, the one who says uh, how good it is that you exist, he mustn't come over as, you know, just using a phrase uh, in order to get me out of uh, my low spirits. It's got to be, he's got to be trustworthy. I have to be convinced that he really sees something in me which he affirms in saying how good it is that you exist. Uh, So, yeah, there's got to be a history there between me and the one who speaks. Uh, And that has to be a history that uh, awakens trust in in the one who tries to give me to myself uh, in saying it's good that I exist. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.